Let's return now to the verbal advantage vocabulary for the next 10 keywords in level 7. Word 31. Engender. E N G E N D E R. To bring about, bring into being, give rise to, cause to exist. Sow the seeds of. Synonyms of engender include produce and generate. Antonyms include prevent, suppress, subdue, quell, and quash. Q U A S H. Engender comes through Middle English and Old French from the Latin generare, to beget, produce, bring to life. Originally, engender meant to beget by procreation, which is a fancy way of saying sexual intercourse. And who told you verbal advantage wasn't a sexy program? Dictionaries still list beget, procreate, and propagate as synonyms of engender. But the sense of breeding offspring has fallen by the wayside, and since at least Shakespeare's day, engender has meant to bring forth, give rise to, cause to exist. A rally in the stock market may engender hope among investors that the economy is improving. An exchange of invective between nations can engender war. Word 32. Fetid. F-E-T-I-D. Stinking. Foul-smelling. Having an extremely offensive odor, as of something rotten or decayed. In Hamlet, Shakespeare could just as well have written, Something is fetid in the state of Denmark. Except that if he had, probably no one would quote the line today. Challenging synonyms of fetid include rank, rancid, malodorous, putrid, noisome, mephitic, and gravelant. Antonyms include fragrant, scented, perfumed, aromatic, and redolent. Fetid comes through the Latin fetidus, which means stinking, from the verb fetere, to stink, have a bad smell. In current usage, fetid is not used of any old bad smell, but is usually reserved for an extremely offensive odor, such as that produced by rotting or decay. For example, bad breath makes you wrinkle your nose. Fetid breath makes you gag. When your garbage is odorous, it smells. When it's malodorous, it smells bad. When it's rank, it's really going sour. And when it's fetid, you'd better get rid of it before your neighbors call the health department. I shall end this malodorous lesson with a pronunciation tip. You may occasionally see our keyword spelled F-O-E-T-I-D, and you may occasionally hear it pronounced fetid. That word 33, pedantic, P-E-D-A-N-T-I-C. Absurdly learned scholarly in an ostentatious way, making an inappropriate or tiresome display of knowledge by placing undue importance on trivial details, rules, or formalities. After that definition, you're probably thinking that your guide through verbal advantage sometimes is pedantic about language. All right, it's true. As we pedantic types like to say, mea culpa, which is Latin for my fault. On the other hand, I am also erudite, which, as you learned in Level 3, means scholarly, possessing extensive knowledge acquired chiefly from books. That's not such a bad combination for someone whose job is to help you navigate the stormy sea of English words. So, my verbally advantaged friend, if you want to emulate my grandiloquent erudition, then please pardon my pedantry as I explain that the adjective pedantic and the corresponding nouns pedant and pedantry come through Italian and Latin from the Greek paedagogos, a tutor of children, the source also of the word pedagogue, which may mean simply a teacher, or a teacher who is narrow-minded, dogmatic, and, you guessed it, pedantic. If we further break down the Greek paedagogos, 
we see that it is composed of pais, paidos, a boy or child, and agen, to lead or conduct, and means literally a leader or conductor of youngsters. For the significance of that derivation, let's turn to the erudite and only occasionally pedantic Century Dictionary. Among the ancient Greeks and Romans, says the Century, the pedagogue was originally a slave who attended the younger children of his master and conducted them to school, to the theater, etc., combining in many cases instruction with guardianship. This servile tutor of classical antiquity eventually rose to become the modern pedagogue, a teacher or schoolmaster. But a stigma of pedantry, meaning a slavish or dogmatic attention to rules and minor details of learning, remained on the word. Perhaps that explains why, when certain members of the teaching profession went looking for a more dignified word for themselves than teacher, they eschewed pedagogue and settled on three terms. Educator, which is a good alternative, educationist, which is a pompous one, and educationalist, which is preposterous. But unless you happen to be a pedagogue, that's neither here nor there. And being the verbose pedant that I am, I digress. A pedant was originally a pedagogue or teacher, but that sense soon fell into disuse, and a pedant became, as the Century Dictionary puts it, a person who overrates erudition, or lays an undue stress on exact knowledge of detail or of trifles, as compared with larger matters or with general principles. The noun pedantry refers to the manners or actions of a pedant. According to the 18th century Irish essayist and dramatist Sir Richard Steele, pedantry proceeds from much reading and little understanding. Jonathan Swift, the author of Gulliver's Travels, defined pedantry as the overrating of any kind of knowledge we pretend to. And the poet Samuel Taylor Coleridge wrote that pedantry consists in the use of words unsuitable to the time, place, and company. The adjective pedantic means absurdly learned, scholarly in an ostentatious way, making an inappropriate or tiresome display of knowledge by placing undue importance on trivial details, rules, or formalities. Word 34. Capitulate. C-A-P-I-T. U-L-A-T-E To yield, surrender, specifically to surrender on specified terms or conditions. The verbs to capitulate and to decapitate both come ultimately from the Latin caput, capitis, which means the head. Decapitate sticks literally to its root and means to cut off the head. Capitulate has sprouted from its root and means to list the terms of surrender under various headings in a document. Although some current dictionaries define capitulate as to surrender unconditionally or on stipulated terms, in precise usage, capitulate means to yield or surrender only on stipulated terms, although the terms do not necessarily have to be drawn up in a document. When armies or nations capitulate, they specify the conditions under which they will surrender. When people accused of a crime accept a plea bargain, they capitulate by stipulating the terms under which they will yield to the prosecution and accept a conviction. And when two parties come to terms in a dispute, you can be sure that one party is the victor and the other has capitulated. The corresponding noun is capitulation the act of surrendering or yielding on specified terms or conditions. Word 35. Inchoate. I-N-C-H-O-A-T-E. Just begun. In an early stage of development. Partly in existence. Not fully formed. Undeveloped. Imperfect. Incomplete. Synonyms of inchoate include elementary, preliminary, nascent, word 22 of level 7, rudimentary, and incipient. Inchoate comes from the Latin incohatus, just begun, not finished, 
incomplete. Incohatus is the past participle of the verb incohare, to begin, take in hand, start work on. Since the 16th century, when inchoate entered English, the word has been used of that which has just begun or is in an early stage of development, and which is therefore imperfect or incomplete. An inchoate state is an initial, undeveloped state. An inchoate idea is an idea not yet fully formed. An inchoate project is word 36, exponent, E-X-P-O-N-E-N-T. A person who stands or speaks for something, a representative or advocate. Exponent comes from the Latin exponere, to put forth, put on view, display. The Latin exponere is also the source of the English verb to expound, which means to explain, interpret, set forth point by point, as to expound an idea or to expound the principles of business management. An exponent may be a person who expounds, an explainer, interpreter, or commentator. But in current usage, exponent more often applies to a person who stands or speaks for something, someone who represents, advocates, or promotes some idea or purpose. The leader of a political party is the exponent of its principles and goals. The pontiff is the exponent of Roman Catholicism. The framers of the U.S. Constitution were exponents of democracy and individual liberty. And Carry Nation, the austere and abstemious 19th century temperance crusader who chopped up saloons with a hatchet, was a radical exponent of abstinence from alcoholic beverages. Word 37. Mendacious. M-E-N-D-A-C-I-O-U-S. Not truthful, lying, false, dishonest, deceitful. Mendacious comes through the Latin mendacium, a lie, from the adjective mendax, which means lying, deceitful. By derivation, mendacious means given to lying, disposed to falsehood or deceit. A mendacious person is a dishonest person, one who is prone to lie or deceive. A mendacious statement is an untruthful statement, a deliberate falsehood or a lie. Synonyms of mendacious include fraudulent, hypocritical, disingenuous, evasive, equivocal, duplicitous, and prevaricating. Antonyms include truthful, honorable, upright, ethical, virtuous, scrupulous, and voracious. Word 38. Strident. S-T-R-I-D-E-N-T Loud and harsh sounding, grating, shrill. Synonyms of strident include ear-splitting, screeching, discordant, clamorous, cacophonous, vociferous, and stentorian. Antonyms include faint, subdued, melodious, dulcet, and euphonious. Strident comes from the present participle of the Latin verb stridere, to make a harsh noise. Apparently, stridere was a versatile word in Latin, for ancient Roman poets and writers such as Virgil, Lucretius, and Ovid used it to describe many sounds, not all of them harsh. The grating of metal on metal, the whistling of the wind, the scraping or whining of a saw, the creaking of a wagon, a rope, or a hinge on a door, the whirring of a rock or an arrow propelled through the air, the braying of an ass, the trumpeting of elephants, the grunting of a pig, the hiss of a snake, and even the humming of bees. The words that English has inherited from the Latin stridere are not so versatile and stick more closely to the core meaning of this ancient verb to make a harsh noise. For instance, the noun strider, 
spelled S-T-R-I-D-O-R, may mean a harsh grating or creaking sound, or in medicine, a harsh sound made when breathing in or out that indicates obstruction of the respiratory tract. The adjective stridulous, spelled S-T-R-I-D-U-L-O-U-S, means making a harsh or shrill noise. And the verb to stridulate, spelled S-T-R-I-D-U-L-A-T-E, means to make a shrill, high-pitched grating or chirping sound. Crickets and various other insects stridulate by rubbing certain body parts together. Our keyword, strident, applies to any sound or noise that is disagreeably loud, harsh, and shrill. A piercing scream, the screeching of brakes, the grinding of gears, the whining of a power tool, the wailing of a baby, or any loud, gruff voice that grates on your ears can be described as strident. Word 39. Oligarchy. O-L-I-G. A-R-C-H-Y Government by a few Rule or control exercised by a few persons or by a small elite group Oligarchy comes from the Greek oligos, few, little, and arcane, to govern, rule And by derivation means government by the few Oligarchy may denote rule or control exercised by a few people, a state or an organization run by a few people, or the few dominant people themselves. And the word often suggests the hoarding of power for corrupt or selfish purposes. Thus, we speak of an oligarchy within organized crime, an oligarchy of the rich, or the oligarchy of the former Soviet Union. For the corresponding adjective, both oligarchic and oligarchical are acceptable. Here is a pronunciation tip. You may hear some speakers pronounce oligarchy with a long O, oligarchy. This recent variant is listed second in two current dictionaries. All other authorities, past and present, do not recognize it. Properly, the initial O is short, as in olive and college. Say oligarchy. Word 40. Refulgent. R-E-F-U-L-G-E-N-T. Shining brightly. Brilliant. Radiant. Resplendent. Additional synonyms of refulgent include gleaming, blazing, sparkling, luminous, incandescent, scintillating, and coruscating. In case you're wondering about those last three, allow me to explain. Incandescent means extremely bright or glowing with heat. It may sound peculiar to say so, but a light bulb, a person's mind, and a spiritual truth all can be described as incandescent. Scintillating means throwing off sparks, sparkling or twinkling. You can have scintillating thoughts, scintillating conversation, or observe scintillating stars in the summer sky. Coruscating means giving off flashes of light, flashing or glittering. An impressive display of fireworks is a coruscating display. A flashy or brilliant performance can be described as a coruscating performance. Antonyms of refulgent include dull, dim, obscure, gloomy, and murky, all of which I know you know, so I think I'll commit an unpardonable act of pedantic obfuscation by muddling and bewildering you with these mind-boggling antonyms. Tenebrous, which means dark and gloomy. Umbrageous, which means shady or overshadowed. Subfuscus, which means dusky or somber. And do you have room upstairs for one more? Crepuscular, which means pertaining to twilight, hence characterized by dim, waning, or glimmering light. Our brilliant keyword, refulgent, comes from the present participle of the Latin verb refulgere, to shine brightly, which comes in turn from re, meaning back, and fulgere, to shine, 
flash, or gleam. You may use refulgent literally to mean gleaming or shining brightly. For example, someone can give you a refulgent smile, or you can explore a cave with the refulgent beam of a powerful flashlight. You may also use refulgent to mean figuratively brilliant or radiant. For example, you may know someone with a refulgent wit, or a person of refulgent beauty. The corresponding noun is refulgence, brilliance, radiance, resplendence. Let's review the 10 key words you've just learned by playing one of these definitions doesn't fit the word. I will say a word followed by three apparent synonyms, but only two of those three words or phrases will be true synonyms. One will be unrelated in meaning. You have to decide which one of the three ostensible synonyms or phrases doesn't fit the word. Are you ready? Here we go. To engender means to bring about, bring up, Give rise to. Bring up doesn't fit. To engender means to bring about, bring into being, give rise to, cause to exist. Fetid means ugly, rotten, stinking. Ugly doesn't fit. Fetid means stinking, foul smelling having an extremely offensive odor, as of something rotten or decayed. Pedantic means showing off one's knowledge in an inappropriate way, in an impressive way, in a tiresome way. In an impressive way doesn't fit. Pedantic means absurdly learned, scholarly in an ostentatious way making an inappropriate or tiresome display of knowledge. To capitulate means to yield, admit, surrender. Admit doesn't fit. Capitulate means to yield, surrender, specifically to surrender on specified terms or conditions. Inchoate means completed, undeveloped, just begun. Completed doesn't fit. Inchoate means just begun, in an early stage of development. Not fully formed, undeveloped. An exponent is an advocate, a representative, an adversary. An adversary doesn't fit. An opponent is an adversary. An exponent is a person who stands or speaks for something, a representative or advocate. Mendacious means lying, bitter, false. Bitter doesn't fit. Mendacious means not truthful, lying, false, dishonest, deceitful. Strident means bold, harsh. Loud. Bold doesn't fit. Strident means loud and harsh sounding, grating, shrill. Oligarchy means control by a small group, rule by a dictator, government by a few. Rule by a dictator doesn't fit. A dictator rules alone. Oligarchy means government by a few, rule or control exercised by a few persons or by a small elite group. Refulgent means luxuriant, radiant, brilliant. Luxuriant doesn't fit. Refulgent means shining brightly, brilliant, radiant, resplendent. That concludes the review for this section. Now it's time to take a look at the fourth category of abusage, which I call adverbiage. Adverbiage is the overuse or awkward use of adverbs, words that modify verbs. Or to put it in non-grammatical terms, words that tell you how an action is performed. Most, though not all, adverbs end in L-Y. 
For example, in the sentence, they listened carefully, carefully is the adverb modifying the verb to listen. In the sentence, he used the word properly, properly is the adverb modifying the verb to use. There is nothing inherently wrong with adverbs, as you can see from my pointed use of inherently in that statement. Adverbs can perform a useful service in expressing nuances of quality or manner. The adverbiage problem occurs when the adverb is part of a cliché or hackneyed phrase, when it is an awkward creation such as procedurally, constructionally, experientially, or opinionatedly, or when adverbs are overused, as in this sentence. As the report clearly states, the only thoroughly and completely effective method for increasing sales rapidly is to competitively engineer and efficiently market our products. That horrendous sentence commits all three errors, hackneyed use, awkward use, and overuse. Moral. Adverbiage always weakens what you have to say. In his style book, Simple and Direct, Jacques Barzan offers these examples of adverbial clichés. To seriously consider. To utterly reject. To thoroughly examine. To be absolutely right. To make perfectly clear. And to sound definitely interested. In each case, the adverb is superfluous. Nothing is lost by removing it. In fact, each phrase is strengthened as a result. I will consider it conveys more promise of serious attention than I will seriously consider it. I reject the allegation is firmer and more confident than I utterly reject the allegation. To be right is unimpeachable compared with to be absolutely right, which suggests that there are degrees of rightness. And let me make one thing clear is a stronger statement than let me make one thing perfectly clear because inserting the adverb perfectly makes you sound either condescending or defensive. Listen to this passage, which I culled from the sales brochure of a company specializing in so-called instructional technology, by which they mean in plain English, training programs. See if you can discern why and how the writing is flawed. Here goes. We understand the critical need for instruction that truly teaches what people need to know. People learn best when the instruction is designed so that it facilitates the learning process and when they thoroughly enjoy the learning activity. That is terrible writing. Unfortunately, it is typical of the thoughtless and careless way many educated and otherwise articulate people use the language. Did you hear the vogue word, catchphrases, and adverbiage? In two sentences containing just 38 words, the writer used the vogue word facilitates, the catchphrases learning process, learning activity, and critical need, and two blundering bits of adverbiage, truly teaches and thoroughly enjoy. The verb facilitate has been in the language for almost 400 years. It's a decent word that comes in handy every so often. The problem is that in trying to pump up their prose, people have overworked facilitate nigh unto death. Why must we always facilitate something when the words help, support, assist, and encourage are there to help, support, assist, and encourage us? Likewise, can't we just enjoy learning without making it a process, an activity, or an experience? And why is a need always critical? Will someone die if it isn't satisfied? If you said, I have a critical need to go to the bathroom, whoever you said it to probably would burst out laughing. Yet, in a world where a crisis must be a serious crisis to merit attention, we fear a need will be ignored unless we say it's a critical need. Finally, we have the adverbiage problem. The writer of those two miserable sentences tried to sound enthusiastic and convincing by using the phrases truly teaches and thoroughly enjoy, but wound up being verbose and trite. In a colloquial exchange with a co-worker about a movie you had seen, it would be natural for you to say you thoroughly enjoyed it and found it truly interesting. 
That's because speech is more informal, more wordy, and less precise than writing, which should be simple and direct, especially if it's a sales pitch. Good tight writing has no superfluous words. The practiced writer learns to cut them out, and the first ones to go are always adverbs. What does thoroughly enjoy say that enjoy can't convey by itself? Likewise, truly does nothing for the verb to teach. You either teach or you don't teach. In fact, the word truly is so often used insincerely that it's hard to believe it contains any more enthusiasm than it does in the complimentary close of a letter, yours truly. Truly, along with the adverbs actually, basically, and really, are filler words that carry little or no weight by themselves. They are common in everyday informal conversation, but in writing they should be used with caution or not at all. The lesson here is don't overwrite. Avoid overused words and overblown expressions. Delete wherever possible. Strive to be clear and terse. Strong writing does its work unencumbered by hordes of adverbs, or, as in the case of critical need, by phrases exaggerated or overused to the point of meaninglessness. And now it's time for another infusion of powerful words that will help you make your expression more muscular. Word 41. Nepotism. N-E-P-O-T-I-S-M. Favoritism shown to relatives. Nepotism comes through French and Italian from the Latin nepos, nepotis, a nephew or grandson. According to the Century Dictionary, the word was invented in the 17th century to characterize a propensity of the popes and other high ecclesiastics in the Roman Catholic Church to aggrandize their family by exorbitant grants or favors to nephews or relatives. In current usage, nepotism denotes favoritism shown to any relative, and the word usually applies to situations in business and public life where relatives are shown preference over non-relatives and receive privileges or positions that they may not necessarily deserve. Thus, if you give your niece money to help her buy a house or persuade a friend to hire your unemployed brother, it's not nepotism. However, when you hire your brother, the bricklayer, as vice president of your sporting goods company, and when you give your niece, the high school dropout who can't type, a secretarial job and six months later promote her to office manager, those are flagrant acts of nepotism. The corresponding adjective is nepotistic, word 42. Ribald. R-I-B-A-L-D. Humorous in a mildly indecent, coarse, or vulgar way. Here's what three leading American dictionaries have to say about our humorously indecent keyword. The third edition of the American Heritage Dictionary says that ribald implies vulgar, coarse, off-color language or behavior that provokes mirth. Merriam-Webster's Collegiate Dictionary, 10th edition, says that ribald applies to what is amusingly or picturesquely vulgar or irreverent or mildly indecent. And Webster's New World Dictionary, 3rd College Edition, says that ribald suggests mild indecency or lewdness, as might bring laughter from those who are not too squeamish, and refers especially to that which deals with sex in a humorously earthy or direct way. Ribald has an appropriately earthy etymology. It comes from an old French noun meaning a lewd or wanton person. This wanton noun comes in turn from an old French verb meaning to be sexually abandoned. And this loose verb is related to an old High German word that meant figuratively to copulate and literally to rub. Although Hamlet's oft-quoted line, I, there's the rub, is not a reference to his ribald fantasies about Ophelia, Many of Shakespeare's plays contain ribald jokes and puns whose mildly coarse and indecent sexual overtones have provoked laughter from audiences for more than 400 years. Synonyms of ribald include gross, indelicate, lewd, immodest, sensual, and obscene. 
Bear in mind, however, that obscene suggests lewdness or indecency that is strongly offensive, whereas ribald applies to coarse vulgarity that is humorous and only mildly indecent. Antonyms of ribald include refined, decent, polite, tasteful, cultured, polished, cultivated, decorous, and urbane. The corresponding noun is ribaldry, which means language or behavior that is humorous in a mildly indecent or vulgar way. Let me conclude this discussion with a pronunciation tip. Some speakers have adopted the indelicate spelling pronunciation ribald, and certain dictionaries that cater to the gross whims of the vulgar masses now record ribald. I urge you to eschew this unrefined variant, and also to avoid the equally uncultivated ribald. There is no rye and there is no bald in ribald. The word should rhyme with scribbled and dribbled. And speaking of rhyme, for your verbal advantage, edification, and delight, I have composed a ribald limerick to help you remember the proper pronunciation of the word. William Shakespeare, whenever he scribbled, used a quill that incessantly dribbled. When his pen leaked a lot, it made Willie quite hot, and he wrote something suitably ribald. Word 43. Avuncular. A-V-U-N-C-U-L-A-R. Like an uncle, pertaining to an uncle, or exhibiting some characteristic considered typical of an uncle. The noun uncle and the adjective avuncular both come from the Latin avunculus, a mother's brother. You may use avuncular to describe some characteristic of your own or someone else's uncle, but the word most often applies to anything suggestive or typical of an uncle. We speak of an avuncular smile, an avuncular slap on the back, avuncular concern, avuncular generosity, and avuncular advice. I want you for the U.S. Army is the finger-pointing avuncular in word 44. Supplicate. S-U-P-P-L-I-C-A-T-E. To ask, beg, or plead for humbly and earnestly. Synonyms of supplicate include entreat, petition, importune, and beseech. The verb to supplicate comes from the Latin supplicare, to kneel, get on one's knees, which in turn comes from supplex, kneeling, on one's knees. By derivation, to supplicate means to beg or plead for something on bended knee. From the same source, we also inherit the word supple. Occasionally, supple is used to mean yielding, compliant, or obsequious, but is now most often used either literally or figuratively to mean bending easily, limber, flexible, as a supple bow or a supple mind. The corresponding noun supplication means either a humble and earnest request or the act of begging or pleading for something humbly and earnestly. A person who supplicates or who makes a supplication may be called either a suppliant or a supplicant. Word 45. Irascible. I-R-A-S-C-I-B-L-E. Easily angered, hot-tempered, extremely irritable or touchy. Synonyms of irascible include cranky, testy, peevish, petulant, irate, cantankerous, contentious, word 16 of level 7, snappish, choleric, captious, and splenetic. Antonyms include calm, unruffled, placid, amiable, affable, and equable. The words irascible and irate, spelled I-R-A-T-E, both come from the Latin verb irasci, to be angry, which comes in turn from ira, anger, 
wrath. This Latin ira is also the direct source of the English word ire, spelled I-R-E. A person who is full of ire, anger, may be either irate or irascible. Webster's New International Dictionary, second edition, explains that an irate person is at the moment angry or incensed. An irascible person is by temperament prone to anger. Thus, when something infuriates you, you are seized by ire, anger, and you become irate, temporarily enraged. However, if ire burns within you constantly, if you are by nature easily provoked to anger, then you are irascible. Irascible may also apply to that which displays anger or extreme irritability. Steve put up with Randy's incessant stream of irascible remarks for as long as he could, but eventually enough was enough, and he became irate. Your irascible guide shall conclude this irate discussion with an uncharacteristically even-tempered pronunciation tip. Irascible may also be pronounced with a short initial I, irascible. Of the two pronunciations, irascible is the older and reflects the quality of the vowel in the word's Latin ancestor. So if, like me, you're a pronunciation pedant with a classical bent, say irascible. However, irascible has been listed in dictionaries since the 1920s and probably is more common among educated speakers today. So if you're easily provoked to anger by word 46. Inexorable. I-N-E-X-O-R-A-B-L-E. -E. Relentless. Unyielding. Merciless. Not able to be stopped, changed, or moved by entreaty or persuasion. Synonyms of inexorable include unrelenting, unswerving, inflexible, immovable, uncompromising, intransigent, obdurate, and implacable. Antonyms include flexible, compromising, obliging, compliant, docile, word 28 of level 7, tractable, acquiescent, and complacent, C-O-M-P-L-A-I-S-A-N-T. Inexorable comes from the Latin adjective inexorabilis, not moved by entreaty or supplication. By derivation, inexorable means not responsive to earnest pleas or humble prayers, and therefore relentless, unyielding. Inexorable and implacable are close in meaning. Implacable is the stronger of the two. It applies to feeling and means incapable of being pacified or appeased. An irascible person might express implacable hatred or implacable resentment. Inexorable means incapable of being moved or changed by petition or persuasion, deaf to all pleas. According to the Century Dictionary, inexorable expresses an immovable firmness in refusing to do what one is entreated to do, whether that be good or bad. It may apply to a person. Joe pleaded with his manager to give him an extra day of vacation, but his manager was inexorable. It may also apply to a thing, as an inexorable campaign to squash the competition and dominate the industry. It may also be used figuratively as the inexorable hand of fate, the inexorable voice of necessity, the inexorable drifting of the sands of time, and the inexorable winds of war all led him to his inexorable doom. In my ability to produce clichés to illustrate this word, I am also inexorable, relentless, unyielding. Word 47. Parvenu. P-A-R- V-E-N-U An upstart Specifically, a person who suddenly acquires wealth and power and rises to a higher class 
but who is not accepted by the members of that class. Parvenu comes from a French verb meaning to succeed and means literally a person newly come into success. Parvenu almost always is used in a negative sense of a person who gains wealth and standing but who cannot gain the social acceptance of the wealthy and powerful. In the eyes of the established elite, the parvenu is an upstart, undeserving, uncultured, immodest, and often pretentious. Those masters of the fine art of condescension, the French, have condescended to give English another useful term for this sort of person. Ariviste, spelled A-R-R-I-V-I-S-T-E. As you may have deduced from that spelling, Ariviste means literally a person who has recently arrived. The word crossed the English Channel into the language about 1900 and is used today of someone who attains social prominence or a position of power, sometimes by unscrupulous means and always without paying the necessary dues. Both the parvenu and the ariviste are upstarts, but the difference between them is this. The parvenu usually acquires wealth and status by an accident of fate, for example through an unexpected inheritance, a business windfall or promotion, or by cleaning up at Las Vegas. Once arrived, the parvenu makes an awkward or pretentious attempt to gain social acceptance from the members of the class into which he has risen. The Ariviste, on the other hand, is a vulgar and often ruthless social climber who has clawed his way to the top and doesn't care what anyone thinks or says about it. Word 48. Salubrious. S-A-L-U-B R-I-O-U-S Healthful Wholesome Favorable or conducive to well-being Antonyms of salubrious include insalubrious, deleterious, word 33 of level 4, pernicious, word 10 of level 7, noxious, baneful, malign, and noisome. The words salubrious, salutary, and wholesome all mean good for your health. Wholesome refers to that which benefits or builds up the body, mind, or spirit, as a wholesome diet, wholesome recreation, or the wholesome effects of building your vocabulary. Salutary refers to that which has or is intended to have a corrective or remedial effect upon the health or general condition of someone or something, as salutary advice or a salutary proposal to revitalize the inner city. Salubrious refers to that which is healthful, invigorating, or promotes physical well-being, as salubrious air, a salubrious climate, or salubrious exercise. Both salutary and salubrious come from the Latin salus, health. The noun corresponding to salubrious is salubriousness. Word 49. Hyperbole. H-Y-P-E-R-B-O-L-E. Exaggeration in speech or writing. Especially extravagant exaggeration that is intentional and obvious. The corresponding adjective is hyperbolic, or less often hyperbolical. Occasionally you will hear an educated speaker who has learned this word from reading, but who has not bothered to check its pronunciation in a dictionary, say hyperbole. Any Joe Blow sports fan will tell you that there's a Super Bowl, a Sugar Bowl, a Cotton Bowl, and a Rose Bowl, but there is no hyperbole. Hyperbole is the only recognized pronunciation, and anything else is downright beastly. Hyperbole comes from a Greek word meaning an excess, something that overshoots the mark. This Greek word comes in turn from a verb meaning to exceed or throw beyond. By derivation, hyperbole is extravagant language that exceeds what is necessary or overshoots the mark. As Bergen Evans explains in his Dictionary of Contemporary American Usage, 
Hyperbole is the term in rhetoric for obvious exaggeration. There is no intent to deceive. The extravagant language is for emphasis only. Because hyperbole heightens the effect of what we say without obscuring its meaning, it's a popular rhetorical device, and many of the most shop-worn expressions in the language are hyperbolic. Here are just a few examples of hackneyed hyperbole. I owe you a million thanks. She waited for an eternity. He was eternally grateful. We are forever indebted to you. I am so tired I could sleep for a week. They ran faster than lightning. He's as strong as an ox. Your briefcase weighs a ton. My feet are killing me. He said he'd do it or die trying. These and many more hyperbolic expressions are acceptable in informal speech and excusable in the most casual forms of writing. But in situations that demand more formal and precise expression, or in which an exaggerated effect would be inappropriate, they should be scrupulously avoided. Not all hyperbole is cliché. There are many memorable statements, withering insults, and powerful speeches that manifest an original, effective, and often striking use of hyperbole. In the elements of speechwriting and public speaking, Jeff Scott Cook defines hyperbole as an exaggeration used to emphasize a point, and offers these examples, among others. Former Texas Senator, Vice Presidential Candidate, and Secretary of the Treasury Lloyd Benson once said, The thrift industry is really in terrible shape. It's reached the point where if you buy a toaster, you get a free savings and loan. Faye Wattleton, President of Planned Parenthood, once said, Those just-say-no to sex messages are about as effective at preventing teen pregnancy as saying have a nice day prevents chronic depression. And the actor Robert Redford once quipped hyperbolically, If you stay in Beverly Hills too long, you become a Mercedes. Some of the finest English poetry ever written also make stunning use of hyperbole. One of Shakespeare's most glorious and hyperbolic passages occurs in Antony and Cleopatra, when Ina Barbus describes the wondrous, irresistible beauty of Cleopatra, who has sailed down the river Cydnus on an opulent barge. Here are two selections from that passage. The barge she sat in, like a burnished throne, burned on the water. The poop was beaten gold, purple the sails, and so perfumed that the winds were lovesick with them. The city cast her people out upon her, and Antony, enthroned to the marketplace, did sit alone, whistling to the air, which, but for vacancy, had gone to gaze on Cleopatra too, and made a gap in nature. Word 50. Sanctimonious. S-A-N-C-T-I-M-O-N-I-O-U-S. Self-righteous, holier than thou, characterized by insincere or affected righteousness, virtuousness, or religious piety. Sanctimonious comes from the Latin sanctus, holy, sacred, and the word was once used to mean holy or sacred. In modern usage, however, sanctimonious refers to insincere, affected, or hypocritical holiness or righteousness. People who are sanctimonious come off as self-righteous and holier than thou, but do not practice what they preach. The corresponding noun is sanctimony, righteousness or virtuousness that is affected or hypocritical. Let's review the 10 key words you've just learned. This time, I'm going to give you the review word followed by three words or phrases, and you decide which of those three words or phrases comes nearest the meaning of the review word. Are you ready? Let's begin. Is nepotism a fascination with violent crime, a devious plot, or favoritism shown to relatives? Nepotism is favoritism shown to relatives. Is a ribald remark foolish, indecent, or straightforward?
It's indecent. Ribald means humorous in a mildly indecent, coarse, or vulgar way. If someone has an avuncular manner, is it like a parent, like an uncle, or like a teacher? It's like an uncle. Avuncular means like an uncle, or exhibiting some characteristic considered typical of an uncle. Does a supplicating person make excuses, make a humble plea, or make a contribution? A supplicating person makes a humble plea. To supplicate means to ask, beg, or plead for humbly and earnestly. Is an irascible person hard to please, easily angered, or quick to take action? An irascible person is easily angered. Irascible means hot-tempered, extremely irritable or touchy. Irascible is also pronounced irascible. Is an inexorable force relentless, powerful, or unpredictable? Inexorable means relentless, unyielding, merciless, not able to be stopped, changed, or moved by entreaty or persuasion. Is a parvenu a beginner, an expert, or an upstart? A parvenu is an upstart, specifically a person who suddenly acquires wealth and power and rises to a higher class, but who is not accepted by the members of that class. Is a salubrious environment wholesome, unsanitary, or clean? A salubrious environment is wholesome. Salubrious means healthful, wholesome, favorable or conducive to well-being. Does hyperbole mean anxiety, exaggeration, or deception? Hyperbole means exaggeration in speech or writing, especially extravagant exaggeration that is intentional and obvious. Is a sanctimonious person self-righteous, impatient, or inconsiderate? A sanctimonious person is self-righteous, holier than thou. Sanctimonious means characterized by insincere or affected righteousness, virtuousness, or religious piety. That concludes the review for this section and for Level 7. Remember to listen to this entire level again at least once before proceeding to Level 8. Now let's examine the fifth and final category of abusage, jargon. As you may recall from our discussion of this word way back in Level 1, jargon denotes a specialized, abstruse vocabulary or any pretentious language that is unnecessarily difficult to understand. Jargon is the worm in the apple of expression. It is the refuge of the timid writer and the smokescreen of the self-important one. The dense, inscrutable vocabulary of jargon excludes the average reader or listener. Whenever you read or hear jargon, you may reasonably assume that somebody doesn't want you to understand what's being expressed or is trying to disguise the dearth of content in the words. Let me give you some examples. Here's the second sentence from the sales brochure passage I quoted earlier in our discussion of adverbiage. People learn best when the instruction is designed so that it facilitates the learning process and when they thoroughly enjoy the learning activity. That 23-word sentence, translated into simple and direct English, can be expressed in seven words. People learn best when learning is fun. The pernicious thing about jargon is that once you start using it, it warps your mind. Or, to borrow a line from one of my favorite folk songs, it will form like a habit and seep in your soul. If some clear-headed person had suggested that seven-word clarification to the writer of the brochure, the writer probably would have said, No, that's too plain. It doesn't have enough oomph. We need to make the company and its courses sound more important. Hey, I know! Suppose I throw in the word facilitate. That's a big favorite among educators. And let's make learning sound more technical and scientific by calling it the learning process and the learning activity. 
Then if I refer to what we teach as designed instruction, ah, me oh my, such is the self-deluding sophistry that leads us, as Theodore Bernstein puts it, to wrap a paucity of information in a plethora of words. Later in the same brochure, the writer shifts into high-flown gear, and we find this pseudoscientific, jargon-infested sentence. Analysis, it reads, involves scoping the nature of the instructional requirements and specifying the tasks, the logistical support, and the instructional management system necessary to achieve goals within the unique constraints of the client's environment. Can you believe this stuff? In plain English, all that means is we create courses that fit your needs. Everyone agrees that the best writing is simple and direct, but when it's time to put our thoughts on paper, most of us become like the person who shakes salt on his food before tasting it. We overseason our sentences with jargon, vogue words, redundancies, adverbiage, and cliches until our ideas lose their natural flavor and our expression becomes flat, verbose, and dull. As the poet Donald Hall once wrote, in our culture, lethargic prose is taken as evidence of seriousness or sincerity. The heavier the subject, the paler the prose. To illustrate Hall's point, let's take a familiar passage from 1 Corinthians chapter 13 in the King James Version of the Bible. Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, and have not charity, I am become as sounding brass, or a tinkling cymbal. Here's how those poetic words would be expressed in today's nebulous, unmetaphorical, bombastic, and jargon-riddled English. Despite the fact that my communication skills have been test-marketed and proven to be completely effective in a variety of goal-oriented management environments, if I have not developed the crucial ability to personally interact with fellow colleagues in a highly sensitized manner, non-terrestrial data suggests that my interactive verbal processing ability will not have a positive impact outcome-wise at this point in time, even in a win-win situation. I hope that outrageous mishmash of overwriting and abusage made you chuckle. The problem is many educated people write and even speak like that. But enough said. I'm sure that by now you get the point. Eschew jargon and say what you mean. And with that succinct counsel, and please note that I said succinct, not succinct, we come to the end of Level 7. I know that in every level of the program I've been drumming the importance of review into your head, but another nudge in the right direction never hurts. To ensure full comprehension and retention of what you have learned, Remember to listen to this entire level again at least once before moving on.